what is going on you guys welcome back to another live stream here if you guys are new to the channel my name is jeremy thanks so much for stopping by here to the sergeant tank youtube channel um oftentimes it's difficult to really come up with a specific topic however uh one of the moderators came up with a topic for us this evening and uh give a shout out to kg or mr kevin green with kg cichlids for coming up with a topic i have talked about crayfish uh in the past however we haven't really gone into great elaborate detail i've done a couple of videos um probably over a year ago now here on the channel but i figured it was an appropriate time crayfish is something that i bred as well as maintained and housed for a lot of years doesn't mean i necessarily deal with as much of it uh but i am quite experienced um when it comes to specifically uh, some appropriate ecosystems and maybe some information that you guys uh, weren't necessarily uh, aware of. Uh, but I want to get a couple of items out of the way. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have a meetup. So I will be in the Hoffman Estates, Illinois area. So if you guys aren't a part of the Sergeant Tank Facebook group, and if you are interested in meeting some of us uh, in that uh, area, uh, area, Chicago, Illinois area, First week in November, so it'll be, I want to say, November the 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't quote me on that, but all the information would be for you guys over on the Sergeant Tank Facebook group page. And uh, there's a couple of questions you guys got to answer. Not a big deal at all. Uh, very um, family friendly. Uh, you know, we try to stay very positive um, and really try to support one another uh, within the hobby. So I do encourage you guys to check it out. Uh, there's a link for you guys down in the description below. We also have a large auction that's going to be coming up here in the Grand Rapids, Michigan market, which would be October the 27th. And registration begins at 9.30 a.m. So there is, um, I don't have the information for you guys. I will do this. So anybody watching this in the replay. I will be sure to add those links for you guys down in the description so you can also check it out. There is an event created over on the Sergeant Tank Facebook group page. If you guys want to check it out. So if you guys want to come out and spend some time and to chat, whatever um, the case might be, I encourage you guys to do it. It's by far one of the largest in Michigan, uh, if not the largest uh, when it comes to uh, an annual auction. So uh, we do expect a, another great turnout, just like we do. We run two of them, one in the spring and one in the fall. All right, so let's get right to it. A um, couple of shout outs here in chat, and then we'll get right to the topic. So we got Dre, uh, Jason Brady, followed by KG Cichlids, Bob Kaler, Keith, AC Aqua. Uh, let's see here. I live in Southeast LA. I know a little about them. Yep. Uh, so, of course, they're going to be more endemic to um, uh, North and Central. Uh, America, I guess you would say more North America. So there is a lot of different species that are native right here in the United States. And uh, I'm going to go through more of the common ones that would be more discoverable within a local market, specifically since we are in the U.S., myself, and I know a lot of us are in the U.S., uh, that I thought it was would be a more appropriate manner in order to address some of those um uh, types of species and sometimes the misconceptions that can go along with it um, and that type of thing. So please go ahead, put your uh, your questions in the chat and I will be sure and get to those. Um, so the first thing I would recommend is understand uh, the number one thing is prohibitations that are placed based on certain uh, geographical areas. So a lot of states, not difficult to find out. Uh, just by doing some basic research online. So if, first and foremost, I have to put that out there. If you are in a state or you reside in a lo locality to where they are prohibited, then really the information here uh, may be just kind of white noise. It's really not going to apply to you uh, because it would be um, uh, prohibited. So obviously I can't uh, condone that type of behavior. Uh, but uh, for those individuals that are in states where they are allowed, and in Michigan is one of them, the other drawback to that is specifically with the Clark eye. Uh, so the Procabaris uh, Clark eye species of crayfish, 
They're actually an invasive species, one that I bred, one that I kept for a lot of years. The ones that you would find now more common in the hobby are going to be the um, Procambaris uh, Alani strains, which in my own personal experience, differentiating the, the two at a younger age can be a little tedious, a little difficult, but as they mature, it's not the most difficult to identify. So the easiest way to identify, I would say, between an Alani and a Clark Eye is Clark Eye generally will get a little bit larger, but that's not always a foolproof method. So if you're looking at the top of the crayfish and specifically with the Clark Eye, uh, you're going to see on top of the carapace, um, you're going to see uh, more of a gapping in between. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain without showing like a visual. And I don't have any here. Like I said, I don't uh, no longer keep the species. Uh, so I can't I can't show you guys a visual aid. Not difficult to go online, uh, find the find the appropriate uh, resources available. Um, if I can find some that I feel are relevant, then I'll go ahead and add those. If you guys are watching this in the replay, uh, down in the description for you guys. But I will go ahead and do a detailed layout for you guys down in the description. If you're watching this in the replay, uh, they give a little bit uh, more of an understanding of what I'm talking about. So the L and I is actually more fused; they're more close. So instead of seeing that gap, let's say it's a half inch gap, um, it's going to be more. It's going to almost look fused and it's going to be more close together. The other thing is with the Clark eye is you're going to see oftentimes more of raised um, uh, a lot of the, uh, what do you want to say, like not the dots, but um, kind of hard to explain it. They're going to be raised. It's not going to be as smooth as what it would be typically on the Allen eye. So most of the ones that you would see in the hobby if they are being classified as a Clark eye strain, uh, keep in mind that they are listed as an invasive species. Therefore, I wouldn't condone or, uh, you know, accept the fact that a local fish store is trying to provide something that is deemed as an invasive species. Um, now, the chances are, and I've, I've seen this for myself, um, is oftentimes they are mislabeled. So that's why I'm kind of giving you guys just a brief rundown of kind of looking at some of the characteristics and differentiating between the two. The other one is the uh, Procambaris phallax, which is your marble soft clone crayfish. I've done an in-depth video on it. Those are ones that I still keep. And a lot of times people breed them since they are a parthenogenic strain, meaning that they are self-reproducing, being asexual, um, that they, they can self-reproduce, hence the name. And you can get some really neat characteristics as far as coloration out of those. You can get reds, even greens, blues. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking specifically how to get some of those because I've done an in-depth video um, talking specifically about that. So you guys can check that out. Now, with the soft clone crayfish, they can reproduce in the masses, especially as they mature. So as a small uh, so let's just talk about size, not age. So let's say you have one that's about yay big. So let's say inch and three quarters, two inches in size. Generally, you're going to get a clutch as long as they don't abort that clutch. And we'll go a little bit into some of the factors that can contribute to uh, failed molts, uh, failed um, holdings and that type of stuff where they can actually abort and kick the egg. So there is factors that can play into that. We'll go into that here in a little bit. The clutch size, let's say, can be anywhere from 40 to 50 on up to 2 to 300 plus, depending on the size of the crayfish. So as they mature, you're generally going to see reproduction anywhere between every four to five months. And again, factors definitely go into that. Um, if you see too much reproduction, sometimes that can be a catch-22 situation uh, to where you don't want to push it too much. So you want to give them time. Uh, in between, uh, let alone you're going to have to realize if you are spawning these, they do get very cannibalistic, uh, especially they're going to predate upon one another as juveniles. Um, that's just a fact. It's going to happen no matter what um, line of sight breaking that you have, no matter how many pieces of PVC you have in there. 
I'll go into some tips and recommendations I have in order to sustain the biggest amounts of yield and even a 20 long ecosystem. Uh, so we'll get to that here in a couple of minutes. So keep in mind if you are doing self clone crayfish, if that is your intent in order to obviously reproduce because they will generally reproduce given the appropriate ecosystem, it will happen. That's just in their nature. That's what's going to happen is people do utilize those for um, feeders. So turtles, puffers, uh, that's just the, the nature of the game. That's the reality of it. Uh, a lot of times people aren't just breeding. They have, you know, 500 or 1,000 crayfish just kicking around in, in order to observe them. Uh, nobody really has the means or the, the appropriate ecosystem in an average home aquaria in order to uh, sustain that type of um, yield uh, for any long period of time. Now with the Alani strains, um, so your electric orange, your electric blues, your whites, again, a lot of different color morphs uh, can take place with them. They're not too difficult as far as sexability. So when you're looking at underneath, and I have talked about this in a, in a brief video, probably a year and a half ago, but if you're looking underneath, uh, basically in the swimmer at area. So if you picture turning a crayfish over, I really wish I had one to just show you guys. Um, but if you look underneath, you're going to see a round uh, anal area. I don't really know how else to make it as uh, family friendly as possible or as PG. Anyway, you'll see that indication in there. And it's very pronounced in the sense where you can identify that it's a female now with the males you're gonna see in the swimmer at area up by the anus I, I mean i don't really know how else to uh, the water it down for you but if you look you're gonna see where they're not the swimmer rats, but you can see where there's almost like it comes back so up towards the the head portion is you're going to see these two almost uh, opaque to white, clearish. Um, they kind of look like swim rats that are going to be more of a solid um, form. Uh, they, Depending upon the size of the crayfish, they may be anywhere from three quarters to an inch in size and look like little needles. And they will kind of face up and flat uh, underneath the body pointing towards the, the head. So hopefully you can kind of get somewhat of a visual idea. You're going to have to use your imagination. So that's a key indicator, that being a male specimen. Now, keeping these guys, so like an Al and I strain, uh, you actually, a lot of people keep them in more shallow tanks. Believe it or not, they enjoy exercise. So I've kept them in uh, 20 talls before, and the, the tip on that is when you actually raise up the height, keep in mind they will climb out, uh, so you want to keep a, a well-tight lid on there. They are escape artists. Uh, so nice piece of driftwood. They enjoy the activity and the thrill of climbing. It's very good exercise for them, and they definitely enjoy doing it. Um, you can keep them in a planted tank. Just keep in mind that they will uproot. So I would use something such as like a Nubius, uh, Java Fern. Um, you can go with like an Amazon sword as long as you keep them fed appropriately. And we'll get into that here in a, in a few minutes. They're not necessarily going to devour the, the plants. Um, it, it can still happen, but just keep in mind that as long as you keep them uh, fed with a well-balanced diet, that they generally will leave those alone. But if you're putting like um, uh, stem plants or something like that, if, if you're actually uh, burrowing the plants, um, especially I wouldn't recommend uh, necessarily a, a sand or a fine substrate, especially if that is your intent to have like a planted tank. You can get by. I've done it before, but I would recommend using more of a, uh, a firmer type of substrate. So I uh, definitely want recommended in a capped so soil, gravel, substrate type of um, method 
uh, more of a dirted tank because it's going to be a nightmare for you. Um, they're going to uh, cause a lot of issues uh, in there. Uh, I can almost guarantee it, especially uh, they do enjoy the burl uh, depending on what the substrate is. So if you use like a finer substrate, they will burrow in that. Um, they will go after, they'll try to search for food, that type of stuff. So it's very entertaining watching them. So they love, absolutely love uh, live black worms. Uh, live black worms, of course, um, being like an aquatic creature can actually sustain and do fine for certain periods of time within a uh, ecosystem, within an aquarium. Uh, used to culture them, uh, even though they get a bit tedious and a bit time consuming, but I used to, decade ago when I was more in the crayfish, I used to keep a lot of the live black worms on hand uh, due to the fact that they were very, um, it was an, it was enjoyment in order to watch the amount of activity uh, that you can get out of one creature. I mean, one pet, one animal, however you want to look at it. Uh, it was quite intriguing to see their type of activity when they're going after um, the food, especially as they start to burrow themselves down into the substrate. So just keep us some of those things in mind. So uh, they do enjoy like uh, night crawlers as a treat. Um, they will uh, eat on uh, cucumbers, zucchini, a um, lot of veg uh, uh, vegetation, so green beans, things like you would feel like a placo like an ancestor's placo that I've talked about before. Um, larger uh, sinking pellets, like cichlid pellets, they do enjoy those. Uh, they enjoy wafers, if that's the route you want to go. So again, giving them a balanced diet between carbohydrates and proteins is important. Uh, they do like uh, and enjoy a lot of vegetation in their diet as well. So you don't necessarily have to go completely shallow tank. They do enjoy the climb. They will tend to be more nocturnal, so coming out at night. So another thing that I would recommend, and sometimes a misconception, even though I'm not being one to sit here and promote and be a huge advocate to keeping them uh, within a community setting, but if the question was asked, could you get away with it? Yes, you can. My recommendation and would be to have fast-moving fish. You're not going to want to put them in with cichlids. The cichlids are going to attack the crayfish. And there's not going to be anything left. The other flip side of that, you don't want to keep them with anything that's slow moving or too small or even too big. Not too big to where it's going to attack the crayfish, but uh, too big in a sense where the crayfish can actually get its main claws around and grab onto whatever specimen of fish that may be. If you ask me my honest feedback, I would tell you to keep them as a species only tank. Um, you can keep them with shrimp, you can keep them with snails, you can keep them, you know, you don't, you can do other things besides just fish. But I would do fast moving fish. So fish that I would recommend, um, if I was going to do it that way, again, I'm not being a huge uh, advocate for this, but if I was going to do it that way, given the appropriate ecosystem, so lots of hides, um, a lot of uh, room to move. If you are going to keep them in, in a community type setting, I would not recommend using any tall pieces of driftwood. That's going to give them leverage in order to um, attack uh, their prey. So, of course, a lot of fish being more mid to top dwelling type species. If you give them that room in order to get up to whatever fish it may be, um, common sense thing is obviously if they have the opportunity, uh, they will go after it. I've seen them actually leap off from driftwood and go after and attack their prey. Typically, just like you would see in similarities with shrimp, if you put your hand in there or if they're trying to get away, they're going to go backwards. Um, they will dart backwards really, really fast. So um, that behavior can be kind of unique in and of itself. Uh, just by, they're, they're a very intriguing species, that, to say the least. If, any, if nobody's ever kept them, um, I wouldn't recommend a crayfish to a beginning aquarist. I've actually turned down, um, kind of talk, not talk individuals out of it, but individuals that have reached out, have never kept, 
uh, crayfish before, kind of new into the hobby. I'm not saying that they're not a hardier species. It's more of an issue of getting the appropriate um, diet balanced in with the overall ecosystem. Because a lot of times folks want to start incorporating crayfish uh, after they've already had like an established community setting. I wouldn't recommend that. Again, if you're wanting Jeremy's honest feedback, I would say just keep it as a species only tank. Now you can get into more of your dwarf or CPO type of crayfish. Um, that is also a possibility that you can go. Of course, they're not gonna be as aggressive um, as what you would see, especially in your Clark Eye or Allen Eye uh, type of crayfish. Um, your self clones can be quite aggressive as well. Um, I've seen them basically even mid-size snap a placo pretty much right in half. Um, you know, if they get their pinchers onto whatever it is, and if you guys ever kept specifically ancestors placos, um, you know how uh, really durable uh, they are. I mean, what what their what their overall body makeup is like. Um, they're really like you know uh, like bulletproof in a sense. So very, very thick outer layers. And uh, yeah, unfortunately I've, I've seen it happen more than once uh, where Placo ended up getting into an ecosystem and it was too late by the time you react. I mean, once, once especially a, uh, a more mature uh, specimen gets its main claws onto whatever fish it may be. And it's a bit more difficult for Placos to kind of get out of reach because, you know, course being more uh, bottom dwelling and then up the glass makes it a little bit more challenging for them um, so obviously I wouldn't recommend any bottom dwelling type of fish uh, in with a crayfish I just wouldn't be an advocate for that so um, you can do schools of uh, tetras um, if the water chemistry is appropriate now these guys can handle a range of water parameters so i'm not going to go through a ton of this and uh, it would take up too much time but the main thing that i can tell you is if you have familiarity with shrimp specifically neo caradina shrimp a lot of the same water chemistry will apply into uh, dealing with crayfish because of their their molting abilities you want them to molt you don't want them to over molt though um, I would say a general rule of thumb is anywhere between, you know, 40 and 60 days ish uh, in that range. If you see a molt, then that's fine. Uh, of course, as they mature, they're going to generally molt more. Once they get into more adult age, uh, the molting will happen probably right around that 45 to 60 day mark. Sometimes it could go every three to four months. So um, it really comes down to the specific genetics uh, of that species. And there's other factors that go into that. Now you can have split molts or a failed molt. Um, and that usually is a calcium deficiency. So you want to make sure that you provide the appropriate amount of calcium, uh, specifically within the water column, not just in the diet itself. So you want to you want to buffer that water, having the appropriate calcification uh, within that ecosystem in order to maintain uh, the appropriate carapace and the overall structure integrity of the, the crayfish. And that's any crayfish that I mentioned uh, with regard to that. And that will generally promote not only for a breeding uh, point of view, uh, but even from the standpoint of uh, providing the appropriate amount of molts and uh, where they're not over molting. Uh, temperature wise, I would recommend keeping uh, the species that I recommend uh, that I uh, just mention anywhere between they can handle quite quite uh, extreme uh, but just like I would advise with shrimp um, specifically neocaridina shrimp uh, I would personally keep them anywhere between 68 and 72 uh, so low 70s is the most ideal and they will breed in those conditions all day long uh, given the appropriate uh, environment now, breeding of your Alani species, so the non-parthenogenic strain, so the uh, Procobaris uh, Alani, or like I mentioned, Procobaris uh, Clarki, which again is an invasive species, but most of the ones that you would uh, see within your local market 
typically are going to be the Allen eye, oftentimes um, confused with a Clark eye. But I'm not going to go back and and uh, and um, uh, you can go back and, and watch this at the beginning when I talked about uh, identifying kind of the differences between the two. So now breeding with them, um, besides the appropriate dietary confusion, I'm not going to go into the stance on that. I've talked about that a lot here on the channel. Uh, but just like I do with any fish, uh, no, invert, whatever the case might be, is I always provide the appropriate balance. Skip feeding, dietary confusion, the appropriate balance of diets between carbohydrates and proteins. Uh, more towards the, uh, if you want really thrivability, I would actually go more in the direction of more vegetation versus more high proteins. High proteins can be an inhibitor uh, when it comes to uh, triggering, especially with a non parthenogenic crayfish. Uh, the other method is a corsion method, uh, which I think I've done a video on. So basically you're taking a known male and a female and you're actually putting them together and uh, you want to basically position them so i call it the corsion tactic so it's it's nothing really probably too much talked about uh, within the hobby but that is actually one method that uh, a lot of um, crayfish if they're not seeing the the uh, breeding behaviors that they're looking for by triggering by mimicking the rainy season kind of cooling down the water um, and then slowly letting it come back up the room temperature that type of thing like we do with a lot of fish um, in order to kind of inhibit some of those spawning behaviors. Um, the other thing is, uh, again, sponge filter, as far as filtration, completely fine. Um, if you're going to go the route and you want to just pick up like a Alani, uh, let, I would just recommend, in my honest opinion, is just get one specimen, uh, getting yourself like a 20 long, uh, go ahead, put some driftwood in there, hardscape it, uh, make it look nice however you want to. I would probably lean more towards the hardscapes versus more of the soft or more of the plant scape just because of the uprooting um, that they most likely will do at some point or another, especially as they mature. And then you could throw in a school of, but keep in mind, you are taking the risk. Uh, what the one tip I would have if you're going to incorporate like a schooling, let's, let's say a group of Tetras or something like that, uh, that will generally stay more mid to top. And now at nighttime, as fish kind of settle and they go into their, their resting uh, space within that ecosystem, I would recommend just having a little bit of ambient light in the background in order to um, provide just enough uh, stimulation for them from a lighting point of view in order for them to still react. So if you go complete dark out, Keep in mind, a lot of fish do rest towards the bottom, and that's where they're going to be more prone towards um, attacks, especially at nighttime, as they are going to be more of a nocturnal type species. So if you want to see really cool uh, uh, feeding behaviors and that type of stuff, uh, not to say that they're not active during the day, however, they are going to be generally more active at nighttime, and they can be quite unique feeders to watch. Uh, so that would be the appropriate time. Uh, to go ahead and actually visualize and watch their behavior. So I can sit here and I can talk and ramble on all day with regard to different setups, how it can look, this and that. Really, it comes down to personal hands-on experience, as I always talk about here on the channel. Uh, so, you know, these are just some basic recommendations that I have. Uh, and... So I think that pretty much covers the gist in a very watered down version, uh, which is quite difficult for me. So I try to be a little bit more elaborative, but I will turn my attention over here to chat. And hopefully you guys were um, intrigued uh, a little bit. So we got D down the wormhole, dank tanks, what's going on? Let's see. We got Frank Dominguez, Jeff Rose. KG, thanks so much for dropping the link. So we do have a few of the uh, uh, Procambarus phallax, which is your self-clone crayfish, available on our website uh, if you want to check it out. But do keep in mind, just as another reminder, that we have one of our auctions coming up here, uh, not through my club, but another club near uh, our location 
Sunday, and I will be bringing a lot of that stuff um, into auction. I talked about it. I just did a video, I want to say yesterday. I uh, did a quick live stream on Facebook and on YouTube with a lot of the species that I have available for sale, and they will end uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, basically at midnight. So if you guys are interested in some of the livestock availability that we have, uh, a lot of ancestors placos, I got trios, reverse trios, endlers, I got lime green endlers, uh, black bar variety, we got limia vitata, so a really nice limia species, another great live bear, prolific live bear, uh, we have the crayfish, uh, we have snails, um, I got live cultures available, so lots of stuff on there. Uh, dry goods. So yeah, feel free to go ahead and check it out if you like. We got Joel in the house. How you doing? Let's see. Uh, we got Heather in the house. I, I arrived just in time for poop talk. Let's see. We got my high. We got Twin City Guppies in the house. How you doing? Uh, let's see here. Uh, will crayfish eat Malaysian trumpet snails? So, yes, uh, they will go after snails. They're typically not going to be on their number one list when it comes to uh, foods. However, you know, if they're hungry, I've seen them go after snails, so. Uh, let's see, but for the most part, not, not the most common, I would say, but it is a possibility. Yes. Let's see. Uh, let's see here. We got Ed's fish. Hello. You guys must have seen uh, my dog, one of them in the background. We got turbo fish in the house. How you doing, buddy? All right. So turbo fish has a great question at what age? So really age comes down to the factors of how fast you're growing them out. So I could, if I put the time into it, again, there is a lot of uh, tips and tricks when it comes to getting things to grow fast. Um, and a lot of that really just comes down to water chemistry besides foods. But I would say on average, um, be on the safe side, you're asking the age, I would say around uh, eight months of age would be on average. But now you might have one that's eight months of age and that big. And then I have one that's eight months of age and that big. So um, it really comes down to uh, a few factors in there. My husband just brought two crayfish home yesterday. Uh, they haven't drained the, the canal for construction and he couldn't leave them there. We got fish traffic in the house. We got honeybee. Hello. Let's see. All right. So fish traffic is mentioning the snow white craw. So they are known as mud puppies, crawdads, crawfish. Uh, people call them lobsters, even though lobsters are actually salt water. It drives me crazy. Uh, completely two different characteristics. Um, but they're always called lobsters. It's just a huge pet peeve of mine. But uh, anyway, so the, the snowball or the electric white, whites, whatever color morph it may be, really doesn't matter. Um, it really comes down to the specific species. So chances are the one that you're talking about is most likely the Procabaris alani, and I am a bit far behind uh, with chat, so I think I've already addressed that, but if you have anything in specific besides what I already mentioned, um, go ahead and let me know.
All right, you guys. So I'm at the bottom of the chat. Uh, go ahead and ask your questions if you have anything. Let's try to stay on topic, though. Uh, is actually, you can thank uh, KG Cichlids for coming up with the topic. I was messaging them earlier, and I said, should I go live? Why not? Um, and, uh, yeah. So I've talked about just about everything at this point on the platform and it's hard to without being too redundant to come up with new topics so he mentioned crayfish so i figured why not so I'll never kept crayfish are they difficult to keep um they can be yes um i've working with an individual right now that's trying to get their ecosystem in balance um that had obtained some of the uh self clones However, not getting the appropriate amount of hardness. We do, just to keep in mind, you guys, if you go to the About on our website at sergeanttank.com, it has all of the recommended uh, water parameters uh, with, with regard to uh, carbonate hardness, general hardness, that type of thing, pH uh, listed on there. So you can kind of get an idea of the conditions for what we breed a lot of our stuff. All right, so AC Aqua has some blues, um, or I'm sorry, has some self clone wanting to get blues. All right, so the main thing is diet. So diet, uh, especially a lot of more color enhancing type foods, uh, can promote. So you may have to use four or five different foods. Uh, you can ask three different people, and all three of them could be feeding the exact same foods, have the exact same uh, strain, exact same lineage. And you may have only one out of the three, and you could be trying to mimic all of the same uh, water conditions, and only one happens to get theirs to turn blue. So the easiest thing that I can explain by breeding and keeping for about 11 and a half years now um, uh, when it comes to crayfish. So in my experience with them... Um, Specifically, the the Procambarus uh, phallax or the self clone crayfish is. Let's say you obtain one from a source and you've all gotten acclimated to your water uh, parameters. That one then has offspring. So let's call that generation one. Now that generation has offspring. So let's call that now generation two. So by the time you get to generation two you're going to start generally seeing without having to use a lot of color enhancing foods a certain ratio not all of them but a certain percentage of those crayfish will start to get some of those blues greens reds uh that type of thing so But I can tell you a lot of people have difficulty with maintaining crayfish for any long period of time, especially the self-clones, because they can be cannibalistic. They can have failed molts. They can kick their eggs. Um, so a lot of factors go into that as far as stress. I would keep them as a species-only tank. If you're going to obtain them, I would just get one, a mature one. If you're going to get a group, get them in a 20 long. Um, if you go too big... I don't recommend it. I used to breed them all day long in a 10 gallon system, and then you would have to have alternate systems in order to put the offspring in. But the smaller the space, I personally found the faster that they reproduce. If you go too large, give them too much space. A lot of times I wasn't seeing that uh, reproduction that I was looking for. So I would say anywhere between a 10 and a 20 long. Um, so the other trick that I can uh, and tip that I can recommend that I've shared before is utilizing a lot of spawning mops. So a lot of the acrylic spawning mops, yarn mops, whatever you want to call them, and have them disperse all throughout the bottom. So not only is that providing good beneficial bacteria, kind of like a sponge filter, housing good beneficialized bacteria, but it's also providing a safe haven for your crayfish. And the thriveability and survivability for your crayfish, I have personally found in my experience much better than putting in PVC, caves, 
Uh, the issue is with PVC, with caves, in a lot of rock piles. I'm not a huge proponent when it comes to rock piles, especially if you plan on redistributing these, if that is your goal. So if you're trying to reproduce, nine times out of ten, I don't care what anybody says, no matter what it is, it's usually for profitability or they're using it for food. So it's one or the other. You're not just looking at it in order to overpopulate the tank. Nine times out of 10, I don't care what anybody tells me, I'm going to call them bluff, is they're going to be utilizing it for something. You are going to notice a lot of cannibalism anyway, irregardless. The reason I don't like PVC, I don't like rock piles, I don't like clay pots. When it comes to a lot of that different stuff, especially if you're looking from the standpoint of, of, of moving these, relocating them, however you want to look at it, rehoming them, using them for food, it gets very tedious and very time consuming. And a lot of that uh, detritus and a lot of the um, dead zone areas in the, that ecosystem can cause a lot of bacterial issues to happen. And that is one of the downfalls with keeping crayfish is they can be prone and susceptible to some bacterial and internal issues. And if that happens, they'll start to get like a milky color and eventually they're just going to decease. Uh, that's the reality of it. So you do need to keep them. I don't care what the internet tells you. I understand the, the, the environments for which they come from. I get it. It's different. It's apples to oranges. You're talking what happens out in the environment when you're provided um, from elements outdoors as far as rain versus things that have been conditioned and acclimatized in order for um, keeping in captivity. So people keep comparing the two. There's apples to oranges. Um, it's one of my biggest pet peeves that someday I'll do a rant on. I'm not going to do it tonight. Uh, but I keep hearing people try to, you, you have things that are bred in captivity and you have things that you've obtained from the wild. It's apples to oranges. Um, so that is where I can tell you, if you're trying to mimic what happens in nature, none of us are going to be able to reproduce what happens in nature. It's not going to happen. Never. Um, not possible, not feasible. I don't care what anybody says. So I would say go with the spawning moths. It's a lot easier to obtain in order to relocate. So if you take a net or a cup, um, I wouldn't gen generally recommend a net just because they can get caught in the net. I just use the good old hands. So just grab it with your hand. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, use a cup, use a bowl, whatever the case might be. If you can picture some of our baba breeders or spawning moths that we carry, um, on the website, if you, you, anybody that's been following me for any period of time knows I've, sh I've shown those before. It's nothing new in the hobby. Anyway, they float on top, keep suspended. I use them for a lot of different reasons. And that is one of them, uh, not only for spawning different species of fish, uh, for, um, egg depositors, but also they work great for crayfish and shrimp. Same concept when I'm sharing here, same thing with shrimp. So if you're wanting to carefully lift up if you can imagine you get your hand underneath there you get a cup underneath there and you slowly start lifting up the mop and if you have enough yield in there you'll see that they'll just start to fall off into the cup it's a lot easier now if you're trying to go after and you got all these beautiful rock piles and everything um from the standpoint of however you want to look at it um you you think that you have this beautiful scape it's not going to be so beautiful anymore when you try to now go after these little tiny crayfish to relocate them uh when you got to start removing all these clay pots placo caves whatever it is that you're using i guarantee you you put the spawning mops in there you'll be thanking me I promise you. So if your intent is to breed, use the spawning mops. Um, don't be using PVC. Uh, don't be using all the other crap. You don't need it. Um, I've done the PVC thing. I'm just telling you, it turns into more of a headache. You don't need it. Uh, so I'm trying to think what else um, with regard to that. But yeah, so all right. Uh, Fish Robic said, did I eat meat tonight? 
now my uh, wife ended up getting pizza. Now I'm just irritated because I've been trying to watch. But I have a weakness. As we all do. So if I can get to that two-week threshold, I can pretty much cut um, where I don't... Two weeks is always the, the, the point. I'm not going to get off in a rant on fitness and all of that, but that dates me way back. All right. Let's see here. I always thought rocks uh, in the mail, a funny concept, but I buy expenses. Uh, can we get a Thursday night rant? Charlotte Mass Aquariums. Um, I've done my rants. I mean, what do you guys want me to rant about? I mean, if you guys want me to rant that bad, I don't care. Uh, let's see. All right, so the weirdest insect that I have ever found in an aquarium, and there is a lot of them, but I would say not the weirdest, but one of the most intriguing. This is going to sound funny to some, but I absolutely love them. I eradicate them, and I'll get into that in a minute. But if I just kept one little nano tank with this animal, it is an animal, and that's hydra. And there's a lot of different uh, species of hydra. However, the one that would be more commonly found in most freshwater aquaria are microscopic little tiny tentacles that come off. Usually they attach onto the glass. They almost look like little deposits of algae. Then all of a sudden you see these little tentacles hanging off and and then they're just chilling there. And then you take like a little, uh, whatever it is, um, you go up and then they retract. So what they do is they basically, how they predate upon, uh, they, they kind of uh, are in anatomy when it comes to like jellyfish. It's the easiest way I can explain it. So they're really, really tiny, very difficult, very easy to overlook. And generally, they're going to get anywhere right around that inch mark, uh, depending, especially if they get fully on out. Uh, but they are very cool to look at. Um, very, very cool to look at. So uh, they are not one, though, that you want to keep in the tank. So the recommendations that... I would have so there is certain species of fish that will predate and eat upon them but when it comes to shrimp when it comes to fry um just about anything uh that they can get up to two to three times their size they will predate upon it they will sting more or less um they're going to uh immobilize their um their food uh, whatever they're they're feeding on, and then they will end up devouring the food. So they are not a good thing to have in an aquarium. So now my best recommendation, again, I'm not going to contradict what I talked about on my quick live stream yesterday. I'm not going to sit here going over um, meds, but I can tell you that fenbendazole will neutralize them Um and it takes up to about 24 to 48 hours. So now dosing, I'm not even, I'm not going into it. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it. But um, same thing with planaria. I find that uh, fenbendazole uh, does much better than levamisole. Levamisole works very well now with uh, camelinalis, um, other internal issues when it comes to fish. But as far as the uh, more free swimming uh, type of uh, parasites like that, so hydra, planaria, that type of thing. Um, fenbendazole works uh, phenomenally well. But again, I'm not going to go into dosage. Um, not even going to go down that road. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it's always good to have those kind of things on hand. And a lot of times they're hitchhikers. You're not going to see it. So um, if if you have a pond outdoors, they can definitely come from that. They can come from plants, uh, especially. So if you order in plants, that's why I. I tell you, 
I practice what I preach, no matter if I'm bringing in stuff from outdoors. So you don't cross contaminate other systems is you want to uh, neutralize those systems by obviously quarantining, go through an observation stage. I'm not going through all of that. Um, I got in-depth uh, videos talking about quarantine, my recommendations that I have, uh, and that type of stuff. So, but that would be, I wouldn't say really the weirdest and it's not like they're uncommon because they're actually quite common. I think just most people overlook them, but, uh, yeah, I've had other weird, strange things, um, but they're really not weird to me. They're actually quite intriguing to look at. Let's see here. <laughs> Honeybee said, stop freaking me out. There's, I mean, that's all part of the ecosystem. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, especially in shrimp tanks, um, for whatever reason, especially in more acidified ecosystems, I know it's a lot more planaria um, and more like neutral, not, I shouldn't say acidified, but more nor, uh, neutral pH. Um, but uh, it can be quite common. Uh, again, uh, some fry will predicate upon uh, planaria. But I wouldn't say planaria is a nasty thing that you don't want either. But the uh, fenbendazole works phenomenally well for uh, getting rid of that. Uh, the main thing is just I, I would recommend a complete dark out phase. Um, and very similar to the same dosage, uh, That that's the easiest thing. Not easiest, but that's the simplest way I can put it. So if you do research and you find information about levamisole, um that is a good starting point for um, for uh, treating uh, your aquarium with regard to planaria hydra. There is planaria traps, but uh, let's see. Praying about Rapashi. Mr. B's, hello. I think it looks like he took off. Uh, let's see. Uh, it ran about rare fish, Michael said. Uh, fish at once, hello. Thanks so much for stopping in. Hit that like button. Fit Tropic said, hey, I appreciate hitting the like. Uh, I want to say yesterday's live stream, we got three dislikes within the first uh, 30 minutes. So bravo. Give you guys a pat on the back. Congratulations. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me either way if it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, I think it's actually quite humorous. Uh, but uh, yeah, so... Um, if you look across the platform, I guess that's something to kind of rant about. I think it's actually quite funny. So look within this niche or the community and start looking at similarities of actual views. Within reason, you will see within reason now, again, this is nothing scientific Something I just have observed by being here on YouTube. There's always a similar amount of thumbs down across the board. So I think there's a select few of individuals out there that just unfortunately don't like Jeremy. And uh, in a lot of us here. So I, I, I appreciate you guys just as much as anybody else. Um, but yeah, Let's see, do you have any invasive fish, uh, where you live besides the ones you have in your tanks? Laugh out loud. Yeah. Right. Um, so invasive species within our home state. So I would, you're put me on the spot. Uh, I should notice information. I would have to use a cheat sheet and, and go to my resources, but um, there's ones that 
are listed technically as I would say more red list, um, especially plants. So a lot of plants. Um, I know that. Uh, uh, come on, um, water lettuce. I know is one that uh, can definitely take over a pond real quick. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think fish wise. So that's a great question though, one that I will answer on the next live stream. But I can't think of any in my in my uh, um, my area off the top of my head. Not there, uh, uh, truly invasive. Uh, when you smash your tank, you got a lot of thumbs down. I thought it was humorous. Uh, it's all about themselves, man. Instant dopamine for them. They have no moral uh, compass or ability to question their habits. I always mix up my habits and feedings. Uh, be funny if everyone hits the thumbs down. Well, somebody already did for me, so I appreciate it. Uh, someone hit the thumbs down. Uh, what the frick? KG. Uh, let's see. Oh, um. All right. Uh, no, I'm a great guy. Oh, I'll get thumbs down. Don't worry. It's always going to be an average, depending upon views, anywhere between three. Three seems to be the magic number. Um, but that's fine. I don't want everybody to enjoy my content. What what do I say? If you if everybody enjoys everything about you, then there's no room for improvement. You know, I'm not here for everybody anyway. Uh, let's see here. We are quite lucky in the UK as nothing that likes heat won't be invasive here. Uh, thumbs down, laugh out loud. I gave someone a thumbs down today. Um, let's see here. Just flip the phone upside down. There you go. Uh, wish there's a thing sideways. I give you a thumbs down every time. I'm sure you do, Matt. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm honored. Uh, either way, a thumb still counts as much as a like. Uh, let's see. All right. Any other questions, you guys? Uh, I, how long have you been going? I don't even know. All right. So we're coming up on an hour here, a couple more minutes, and we're going to go ahead and wrap this live stream up. I am spent. Uh, thanks for the suggestion, KG. Uh, if it wasn't for KG coming up with the suggested topic, uh, wouldn't have jumped on here live. Bitch Tropic said, Jeremy, don't leave us. I can't do five and six hour live streams anymore. Just can't do it. So who's going live? Anybody going live after me to carry on? Uh, let's see. Thanks so much, D. I appreciate you you lurking. Uh, well, uh, expect tomorrow uh, the edited version of Josh Cunningham live stream that I did will be out for you guys at some point tomorrow. I don't have a. I got to finish doing that uh, tomorrow morning. And get that out for you guys. Uh, KG said he tired me out because I had to get out snails. Uh, let's see. Uh, All right, you guys, I think that does it. How do you find out if you're not sub to them? Okay, so go to the main page on somebody's channel.
So let's just pick on Dank Tank. So if you put in Dank Tanks and you go to his channel up in the top right, you're going to see where it says subscribe. And if it shows that you're where it's lit up in red, um, then you'll know. And then it will, it will, you'll just know. I don't really know how to explain without showing you, but you'll know. It'll say subscribe uh, versus subscribe. And then you'll want to hit that little bell and put on notifications uh, so you get the uh, their notifications. Uh, live stream. How do you find out if you're not sub to them? Live stream. I'm not sure I'm understanding. If I... Hmm. I think I'm having a... A brain fart here. <laughs> um, how do you find out if they're not sub live stream? If I, if I don't, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure, honey B. If I'm if I'm following you. Yeah, relapse. <laughs> um. If you don't know them, how do you find out if you're not? Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm just going to end it. I'm like, um, anyway, I'll try to address that one next time. Now I'm just looking like a fool. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm not quite understanding. Uh, can, <laughs> can you find out if anyone fishy? Oh, is live. All right. So. Uh, yeah, the I'm trying to think. There is some Facebook um, groups out there that will put out a schedule when it comes to doing live streams. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, without being really subscribed, there really isn't a definitive way. Uh, fortunately, because of the whole uh, YouTube platform, even if you are subscribed to somebody and have notifications, I can tell you a lot of times, unfortunately, notifications still don't go out because I have it happen myself. Uh, if I am subscribed to somebody, have notifications on, I'm not even aware when they go live. Uh, the main thing is just kind of knowing somebody's schedule. Uh, but yeah, I would say for the most part, Honeybee, I know that you're very engaged throughout the community. Uh, so the regular live streams at this point that I'm aware of anyway, uh, would be the ones, cause I think I've seen you in just about every, uh, live stream out there within the, the community. Um, but yeah. I put in a request to join Facebook group the other day. Haven't checked yet to see if it's been accepted. Uh, which one fish at once are you talking about for the Sergeant tank? <laughs> Honeybee's getting the kick out of it, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't sleep much. I probably sleep about an hour on average each night. So, um, it definitely catches up with you. Uh, the Sergeant Tank, I believe. Let me check real quick. My handy dandy uh phone here. Let's see if there's any members. Uh oh. Well, my admins and my moderators over there are a little bit behind uh the game. So, everybody there that was a uh, member request, as long as they answer the questions, are now approved. So, you should be all set now. I apologize about that. Um, yeah, we should be good now. If you have any other issues, let me know. Yeah. Thanks, Turbo Fish, Mr. Admin over there, Mr. 
I won the the uh, um, the cover photo contest. Uh, said no member requests after you let them all in. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm just I'm going on about nothing at this point. So <laughs> sorry for the 23 watching. It's usually not like this. Anybody new? Um, I think it's just uh, going three or four days in a row now doing live streams. Just can't do that stuff. So. I'm going to take a few day break at this point. I will get you guys that video out at some point tomorrow with the Josh Cunningham, more edited version. I encourage you guys to definitely check it out. Uh, a lot of good information in there. And yeah, with that being said, you guys always stay encouraged. Keep on keeping on happy fishing until next week sometime. We'll talk to you.